Welcome to St. Charles United Methodist Church. We are glad you're worshiping with us today in person and online, I hope. <laughs> the announcements. Uh, the red view pad, please sign and pass it along in your view. The uh, judge and concerns are inside. Uh, fill them up. They'll be picked up at the first hymn. And the ones online, if you have a concern, joy, send it, type it in, and somebody will bring it up for the pastor to read. Today is, <clears throat> today is Communion Sunday. We, uh, the announcements for this week, well, there's a super cool Sunday school starts next Sunday. And it's the uh, grades kindergarten through sixth. We have a coffee hour following worship next Sunday. And it's uh, in honor of uh, Appreciation Month for the pastor. Uh, outreach committee is at our hometown days up down. That's today. Uh, we're working on our. Uh, we're still doing our uh, backpack program, uh, food donations. We have uh, electric roasters for sale, uh, lid included, twenty dollars each. And they're lined up in the fellowship hall there. I see. Uh, Thursday Bible study is uh, is Thursdays, October fifth through November sixteenth, from seven to eight. The Book of Matthew. And it's led by Pastor Brenda. Uh, Thursday is prayer group, 10 a.m. on stage. Next Saturday is the Blessings of the Pets from 10 to 11.30 in the parking lot. And I covered that already. <laughs> uh, I think that's, I think I got everything covered. Has anybody got anything to say about today? To the do that? The hometown days? <laughs> if not, please stand if you are able for a call to worship. As people of Christ, we seek to be of the same mind as Christ. As people of Christ, we seek to have the same love as Christ. As people of Christ, we seek to unite our selfish ambition for what we seek. As people of Christ, we proclaim together that Jesus Christ is Lord. Let, Let us, us worship joyfully. Opening him, come share the Lord.
join me in our opening prayer. Teach us, good Lord, to serve you as you deserve, to give and not to count the cost, to fight and not to heed the wounds, to toil and not to seek for rest, to labor and not to ask for any more war, except that knowing that we do your will, through Jesus Christ our Lord. scissors go and on the word go you either make your hand like a rock paper or scissors and the rock breaks the scissors scissors cuts paper so it wins over paper and paper covers the rock so any one of you could win but play against me so what I've done tells you whether you've gotten through or not so let's try it rock paper scissors go and I've got paper so if you've got scissors, you beat me. If you've got a rock, sit out this next round. Okay? Rock, paper, scissors, go. I've got the scissors, which the rock would break the scissors. So if you had rock this time, you won. Okay, we got a couple still going. Okay? Rock, paper, scissors, go. And I got paper again. Some of you thought I was going to do rock on the third one. <laughs> okay, so paper covers rock, but scissors cut paper. So again, if you've got scissors, you won. Okay, I think maybe everybody was out on that one. So and maybe we had a couple more, but um, I actually have then the rock, paper, and scissors with me. And the they each have their own... They each have their own purpose. If you plan to write a letter, these aren't going to do you any good, but this one will if you have something to write with. Okay? If you want to cut paper, a piece of paper itself isn't going to help, the rock's not going to do you any good, but the scissors will. And if you are thirsty, which one of these might work? Paper? Yeah, and I heard somebody say it. There's a story in the Bible where Moses tapped a rock at God's instruction and brought water from it because the people in the, in the desert, the Israelites in the desert, were complaining that they were thirsty. And Moses, according to God's direction, tapped the rock and got water for the people. So the things, the resources we have in our lives are all good for something. No one thing is good for everything. And people are the same way. We're all gifted differently. Some of us can be very helpful in a medical emergency, others of us not so much. But some of us can lead a program, give people instructions, do some teaching. We can build things with our hands. Not everybody can do all of those things necessarily, but we all have our uh, our own gifts and God will call us to use them. There is children's time, and let's move into our ministry of prayer. We have one for Brian and Anne, one for a 60th class reunion, good to see old friends and tour the new Merrill High School. 
Wayne Schultz is having surgery on his knee again on Tuesday to remove pins and plate. So keep that in your prayers. Healing for Ann Sanders, who has had a hip replacement, doing well, but still dealing with some pain and things. Um, and Kelly Wilkin, Wilkins, who has upcoming surgery tomorrow, correct? So, um, and that's hip replacement also. So keep those in your prayers. Um, we had one this week, thankfully. It was a scare that didn't, didn't result the way it could have. But we found out this week mom has AFib, and the kidney doctor is the one that caught it, sent her to the cardiologist, and they're treating her with medication. So thankfully it didn't turn out to be quite the major scare that, it, that we were afraid of at first. Um, also have one to add this week to our prayer list, Colton Foley. And uh, this is going to sound like a friend of a friend of a friend kind of thing, but my sister called, it's her nephew's son her husband's, on her husband's side of the family. So um, he is se was 17, killed in a head-on car crash on Friday. So um, keep his family in your prayers. And I noted on Facebook earlier this week too that that's, there's been a lot of teenagers killed in some kind of vehicle accident lately. <clears throat> I've seen them on news reports, um, bicyclists hit by cars, young drivers in an accident, you know, just, there's been a bunch of them lately. So prayers for uh, that whole situation, that people will pay attention and drive carefully and watch out for one another. Pardon? Oh, I thought I heard somebody say something else. So let's go to the Lord in prayer, and I'll give you a moment to share with God those things that you haven't spoken or written, and then I'll lead us in prayer. And God of grace, We thank you as we always do when we take the opportunity to be together in your name. We thank you for a building where we can gather in person, for technology that allows us to gather, not face to face, but still experience a time of worship together. We thank you for a community celebrating our unity and uh, celebrating the resources that the community has to offer this day. For a time of worship and the opportunity to share our joys and our concerns with you, knowing that you're already at work. For your healing presence that works through surgeries and that is with us in times of illness and recovery from surgeries and injuries. We thank you for doctors who do your healing work through their hands, for family members who care for us, again, doing your work through their hands, and loving us as you would call us to love one another. We thank you for milestones in our lives and times to celebrate together <coughs> our education and those friends that we have made along the way, and to celebrate a new school that allows for further education. And Lord, do speak to each one of us in our hearts and our minds that you might use our hands and feet and voices and wisdom to do your work. When you call us, sometimes we experience fear and uncertainty and questions. And we listen for your voice, that you might address those fears, that we might be ready to step forward and answer your call as you give it to us. 
So do help us to hear your call as we are together this day, what you would have us do, how you would have us grow in our faith. And then when our service is completed and we leave this physical or virtual gathering, may we be ready to answer your call as you would have us do. And all of this we ask in the name of the one who taught us to pray. Uh, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. happens next Saturday. The fourth is actually the, the celebration of St. Francis. So um, it was good to recognize that this morning. Our scripture comes from Matthew chapter 21, verses 23 to 32. When he, that is Jesus, entered, entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, by what authority are you doing these things? 
And who gave you this authority? Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one question. If you tell me the answer, then I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. Do the did the baptism of John come from heaven or was it of human origin? And they argued with one another. If we say from heaven, he will say to us, why then did you not believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the crowd, for all regard John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. And he said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. What do you think? Jesus continued. A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work in the vineyard today. He answered, I will not. But later he changed his mind and went. The father went to the second and said the same, and he answered, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of the father? They said, the first. Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, the tax collectors and prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him, and even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe him. The word of God for the people of God. Amen. So a group of military leaders gathered for a training on a supercomputer supposedly able to solve any problem. The engineer connecting, conducting the demonstration instructed the officers to feed a difficult tactical problem into it. They fed in a hypothetical situation and asked the question, attack or retreat? The computer hummed away for about an hour and then printed out a one word answer. Yes. The gen these were generals, they looked at each other confused. How do we respond to this? And finally they entered, yes, what? Question. The answer, yes, sir. <laughs> Not the helpfulest of answers, but that was the answer they got. I have to say, Mom and I do this to each other every so often, too. We'll ask, you know, do you want to go to Culver's or Bob Evans for supper? And one says yes, because either answer is okay. <laughs> but, yeah, not the most helpful of answers. Are we a bit like the computer sometimes when God enters a command into our hearts with a question, will you obey? Do we find it easy to initially say yes to God, but difficult to actually do what God says? Check your heart when you hear from God. Maybe, maybe say no to God at first. Take time to work out whatever uncertainties or other desires or distractions come to you. Start out by telling God, but I could never do that. But then be willing to let God work in and through you to do God's work. You might remember early on when I first came here, I told you the story of my call to ministry. And I mentioned that, you know, there is the saying, if you want to make God laugh, tell God your plans. But I had changed that just a little bit. If you want to make God laugh, tell him, but I could never. And finish that sentence however you would finish it with whatever you don't feel you could ever do and then watch God work. In the first part of Matthew's story the chief priests and elders have asked Jesus where he gets his authority to do what he does and according to the rest of the chapter where our passage came from this morning they're talking about cleansing the temple where Jesus overturned the tables of the, the money changers. 
They're talking about him cursing a fig tree. He's just done that. And now he is teaching in the temple. And they want to know, where do you get your authority? And Jesus answers a question with a question. John's baptism, a call for repentance. Is that from heaven or is it of human origins? But they are stuck. If they say heaven, Jesus is going to say, okay, then why didn't you listen to John? If you knew he was bringing a message from heaven, why didn't you listen to him? If they say it comes from human origins, then those who believed John was a prophet might riot. You're talking against him. When they can't answer Jesus' question, he doesn't answer theirs either. Because they're not sincerely seeking information. They're trying to test Jesus. Where do you get this authority? You're doing all this stuff that's so different from our traditions. Where do you come across doing this stuff? And he knows they're trying to trap him, so he just, he turned the tables on. After that interaction about Jesus' authority and the power of John's baptism, then Jesus tells the parable about two sons. Father asks them to work in the vineyard. One uses the rhetoric of obedience, saying, that, saying what he thinks the father wants to hear so that he sounds good. Yeah, I'll go. But he doesn't actually go into the vineyard. The son who says no to the father at first, but eventually goes to work anyway, actually goes beyond rhetoric to relevance. Rhetoric is defined as the art of effective and persuasive speaking or writing, especially the use of figures of speech and other compositional techniques. So knowing what to say, what people want to hear, when to say it, how to say it. Relevance is closely connected or appropriate to what is being done or considered. So in this case, the actual action that you were instructed to do. For disciples following Jesus, obedience to Jesus' design for change, for righteousness, and for love is what makes the difference between the two. First, Jesus designs a way for change. That's a hard word for us to hear sometimes. But Jesus makes a way for change. The son who first said no to the father repents. He changes not only his mind, but the direction of his behavior. Tax collectors and prostitutes have done wrong, and in effect, they've said no to God. But they have, and were apparently beginning to live up to, the potential to change for the better. The chief priests and elders, on the other hand, say they will do good, even claim to be doing good. But even though they follow and enforce the letter of the law, in practice they oppose Jesus. They use the law against him and others instead of understanding and living by the spirit of the law. John and Jesus both call people to repent, to turn around. Following Jesus means patience and perseverance. Keep going, even when the going gets tough. Quitting is frowned upon when you're doing what God calls you to do. But sometimes we misinterpret God's call. Maybe we start out with good intentions, but in a different direction than where God was calling us. Or we find that a certain calling is for a certain time. The father in the parable said, go and work in the vineyard today. Tomorrow the instructions might be different. Even when we're following God closely, there does come sometimes a time for change. Listen for God to lead, to open and close doors of opportunity. Quit what you're doing and change directions when your heart isn't in it anymore. God might be preparing you to use your gifts differently. Pull over and listen for new directions if you cannot see the path forward. Like the chief priests and elders who were trapped with no good answer to give to Jesus' question. And if you've been avoiding what God wants you to do, it's time to embrace it. 
The son who said no to working in the vineyard eventually realized he was avoiding what his father had asked of him, so he changed directions, went and did what he said he wouldn't. So Jesus designs a way for change. He also designs a way for righteousness. Righteousness meaning having a right relationship with God. The definition of righteousness is not based on religious obligations. We expect that we need to give to support the ministries of the church. We should be reading scripture and, and praying regularly to keep us uh, in conversation with God. We decide at times between right and wrong, who can do what in church, what it means to take time for Sabbath rest, and we need to make some of those decisions and act on them. But in the course of those actions, we must not forget the bigger matters of justice, mercy, and faith. Good behavior and works alone don't get us into right relationship with God. But as James 2.26 says, faith without works is dead. I don't know how many of you have heard it, but there's a song from quite some time ago that says, faith without works is as worthless as a screen door on a submarine. It's there. It's not helpful if it isn't accompanied by works. And Micah 6, verses 6 to 8 says, after a question of what might please God, will God be pleased with offerings of rams or oils or even my firstborn child? Micah asks and answers a question. What does the Lord require of you <coughs> but to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with your God? People are curious about new things, but we also tend to fear anything that's too new. The people liked John because his baptism and the things he was saying about Jesus, the one who was to come, was new and it was thrilling. So they were baptized and they were waiting for the one that John had proclaimed. But John was not so new. He came from a long line of Hebrew prophets who had relayed warnings and other messages from God for generations. The chief priests and elders knew the history. They've heard a new call from John to turn away from sin rather than trying to justify it as they tended to do. They don't know how to answer Jesus' question about where John's baptism comes from. Either answer gets them in trouble somehow. So Jesus has designed a way to change, a way of righteousness, and finally a way of love. God's love and Jesus' own love for the world was the motivation behind everything that Jesus said, did, and taught. The Old Testament law and prophets had already written about love of God and loving your neighbor. So Jesus' teaching was not totally unfamiliar. On the other hand, Jesus taught a new understanding of love that turned the previous understanding on its head. Love the Lord with all that you are and all that you have, and love your neighbor as yourself, or love your neighbor as Jesus has loved you. And that's pretty potent love with all that Jesus had given for those he loved, some of whom were not even born yet at the time. So Jesus' command to love your neighbor was not doing just what the law requires and avoiding what it forbids. They were used to that. Marking off the things you've done, the wrongs you've forgiven, ready to stop forgiving, for instance, if you maybe forgave the same person seven times. But loving with the patience, kindness, perseverance, and forgiveness that 1 Corinthians teaches. Knowing, for example, that forgiving 70 times 7, which is what Jesus said, was not instruction to get a bigger piece of papyrus 
and so that you can mark off more times that you've forgiven. Doesn't mean you can stop at 490 times, that's 70 times seven. It means forgiving all wrongs done to you and moving forward without the baggage of having to keep a record at all. When God calls us to change, when he calls us to check to make sure that we are right with God, living in righteousness, and when God calls us to love, how will we respond? Will we give God a rhetorically correct but impulsive answer of yes, which might be followed by distractions and fears and other desires and failure to actually obey God? Or will we acknowledge to God our hesitance and leave room for change of direction toward where God leads to a new, right, and loving life of service? And let us pray. And God of grace, we thank you that you call us to do your work, that you are present with us not seven times a week, not even seven times in a moment, but 70 times seven and more. Call us to do your work. And we thank you for understanding that we in our humanity sometimes are quick to say, God has asked and we will go, and yet we never quite make it to the goal you have set. Lord, help us to acknowledge to you our fears and our uncertainties and those things that get in the way of our relationship with you so that you can get those things out of the way and move us in the direction that you would have us go. And all of this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And this is our day when we celebrate Holy Communion at the Lord's table. And if you were watching us online and have bread and juice uh, handy, you are welcome to take those uh, as a symbol of God's gift in Jesus along with us. And by way of invitation, Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin, and seek to live in peace with one another. Before I move forward, I'm going to see if my other mic will work. <laughs> it doesn't want to. So I'm going to speak loud. If we get it running, I'll put it on. But the, the invitation that Christ our Lord invites to his table, those who love him, who earnestly repent of their sins and seek to live in peace with one another, goes to those who are, are here uh, face to face and joining at the table together, and also those of you that would choose to join us virtually in our time together at the table. And so, because Christ invites us all to his table, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. God. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks.
thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. he gave himself up for us, Jesus took bread, broke it, blessed it, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ is God, Christ is risen, Christ, Christ, Christ is all the man. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us, gathered here, and on these gifts of bread and the cup. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. I'll ask the servers to come forward, and we will serve each other, and then the table will be set for you. Just a reminder, we do have gluten-free bread that will be on either side of the altar rail, or you can pick that up if you need to.
before we reset the table, was there anyone who wished to be served but didn't make it forward? And let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for inviting us to your table. We thank you for your invitation to celebrate the gift of your son, his body broken, his blood shed for each of us. For your love and generosity that gave us such a gift. We ask that you would speak to each heart and that we have taken the elements of bread and the fruit of the vine into our bodies. May we make the decision once again to take Christ into our hearts and our minds and our lives. And may we follow your example of generosity as you have given us the gifts we have shared for the ministries of the church. Bless the gifts, the givers, and those who will receive. In Jesus' name, amen.
just said the yes. What he says we will do, where he sends we will go. We've said it. And now we go forth to do as God has commanded us and to love those that we encounter this week in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.